As Kennedys, my next guests have been around politics their entire lives. Who better to talk about surviving a scandal like Chris Christie's Bridgegate? Joining me now, Christopher Kennedy Lawford, author of a new book, What Addicts Know, Ten Lessons to Benefit Everyone. Also former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. He's the co-founder of One Mind for Research and founder of the Kennedy Forum. Welcome to both of you. Now, before we get into the book, which is fascinating and, and extremely timely in many ways, let's talk about Chris Christie, because no family knows more about political intrigue and scandal and winning and losing elections than your family does. Patrick, what do you make of this? The difficult thing he has is that people think this scandal fits him and what they know of him. So he's kind of known as a bully who acts kind of intemperately. So people can picture him flying into a rage and saying, we're going to have a payback here for this guy. It, I mean, it fits with what people know of him. That's the damage here. There may not be any dots to connect, but in people's minds, this is kind of Christie-like in the kind of way that it was done. And you're so, a New Jersey resident. I'm a proud Jersey resident. He's your now. governor. <laughs> he is, and he's been very good on, on many things since the reason he got reelected so overwhelmingly. Um, but we all have character flaws, and certain things, if they're exposed and they stick in the public mind, really stick because of the way people know us. And this is the kind of thing, I think, that fits with the guy that people know as Governor Christie because he's that kind of guy who's in your face, kind of bully-like sometimes. And, and so people, I think, can look at this and say, oh, that isn't out of character. I can picture him doing that. And that's the danger for him. Having said that, Christopher, I mean, he's, he, he's, he would say, look, I'm not a bully. I'm a straight talker. I'm a blunt speaker. Uh, I call things for what they are. And I call people out when I see injustice or people attacking me or whatever it may be. And to date, nothing has come out which actually says he has lied right. about what he knew about He's this. He's the current political pinata. Right. I mean, basically, <laughs> and, and like pinatas, people put blindfolds on and they just whack him. So he's going to have a lot of that. And, you know, if, it's, if, the, if you can't stand the heat, don't get in the kitchen. He made himself a national figure. Um, everybody knew this day was going to come. And we'll see how he fares when the, when the spotlight is on you. I mean, they built him up, mm. and I've always felt they did it because they like to tear people down. And uh, I've seen in my own life, I saw it with my dad, they brought him in, said his poll numbers were great. Once he stepped into the race, boy, they did a hatchet mm. job on him. Speaking of the dark side of politics, an upcoming book, HRC, State Secrets and the Rebirth of Hillary Clinton, asserts that Clinton's presidential campaign in 2008 kept formal lists, spreadsheets of Clinton supporters and detractors. Your father, the late Ted Kennedy, was on that list as an early backer of Clinton's rival, Barack Obama. What did you make of that? I knew that President Clinton particularly had a lot of misgivings with my dad's moving towards an endorsement for then-Senator Barack Obama. I can understand that. President Clinton was very good to my family, but of course, my family played a role in helping President Clinton. It was a two-way street. But I can definitely understand where there were hurt feelings there. I think my dad took the, the long view, and that was that his brothers were there in the civil rights movement early on. And I think he felt an obligation not only uh, to making a political decision, but to his brother's memory. And I think he felt this obligation to be with his historic figure, Barack Obama, at the time. So I hope that the Clintons understand that. Uh, I know in the heat of the moment you can't because that's just the way things are. Let's move on to this book, uh, Christopher, because what addicts know, 10 lessons from recovery to benefit everybody. What is the point of the book, and what is the key thing that you want people to take away from it? Well, that people that recover from this brain illness have a lot to give the world, that more than just their sobriety. People often look at this population and go, as long as they're not using, they're fine. There are 23 million people in recovery in the United States of America, just in the United States. They have enormous experience, wonderful experience, and they have a lot to give the world in terms of how to live life and how to have a happier life. Our culture is riddled with addiction, not just substance and behavioral, but technology, the uh, materialism, all of it. And people are looking for answers there. There are no answers there. And we know that as a community, we know how to get, we know how to become, I think, more fulfilled. These are not new principles, by the way. But that's the idea, that this is a community that has a lot to give in. And basically, they do not deserve the stigma and the discrimination that they face once they find recovery. What do 
you make, uh, Patrick, maybe ask you on this, about the legalization of marijuana debate, which is now raging. Obviously, Colorado uh, this year has already gone uh, and made it pretty much fully legal. In terms of the claim that people say, look, it's a gateway to, to other drugs, do you subscribe to that? <coughs> well, first, let me say the war on drugs was an abysmal failure. And I worked in Congress to try to uh, move to treatment and treat these issues as health issues, not criminal justice issues. And I still believe that. But understanding that legalization increases use, and there's a corollary there, particularly amongst young people, is something that's hard to ignore. So I can't be for legalization because I can't be for more teenagers using. And in my own case, I started using as a teenager, and 9 out of 10 addicts started when they were teenagers. Your brain is still forming. This is a dangerous time to be starting drugs. And this notion that legal, oh, it's just legal for 21 and over, we all know that's a, a lot of hooey, that it's going to be a lot of kids that now use. And I don't think our country appears just at the but end of the lots day. lots of kids using it anyway, and, and the argument that they will get it anyway. No, no, because 52% of teenagers use alcohol, it's because it's legal. Tobacco, same thing. So it's only 8%. Of course, there, there are probably more than, than that that report it. The point is, is that a lot more will use if it's legal. That's the two most uh, damaging dr drugs on the planet are alcohol and tobacco, mm. to society and to the individual. The question is, do we need another one? Prevalence matters. And when you legalize something, prevalence increases. As a country, we should try to do better. I mean, just in general, this is not what's going to make our country strong. It's going to sap our collective energy as a society. I think we should try to care about where we as a country are going. We have a, a learning gap amongst kids. This is only going to widen that gap. We have a competitiveness gap around the world. We can't be a first-rate nation and go to pot. I mean, that's just what, it. What addicts know, 10 lessons from recovery to benefit everyone. It's available now. Christopher, you'll be signing books in Boston, Philadelphia, D.C., later this month. For more information, check it out at ChristopherKennedyLawford.com. Great to see you both. Great to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Good, Good to see you. Thanks, Pierce. Good to see you.